Well, Larry, now eight days after you win in the great race, are you still caught up in the euphoria or have you come back down to earth? Oh, no, we, we're uh, uh, obviously uh, still very pleased about the race, but uh, we're back to business as usual. Now, like, don't forget, it's now only 51 weeks to next year's Bathurst, and uh, uh, we've got lots on. We've got a new car to build, uh, three customer cars to build, engines left, right and centre. No, we have to get back to earth pretty quickly. Prior to 1993, you stood on the podium three times at Bathurst with Peter Brock and uh, they were obviously very satisfying wins, but this one must have been all that more special. You did it from the front, which was, I know was important to you, but obviously in a, in a Larry Perkins engineered car in every respect. Yes, it, it certainly was different, not the slightest bit of doubt about it. It was uh, totally uh, my show. Everything was done the way I want to do it. Um, to lead from the front, though, is uh, from, the, from the driver point in me, I'm, I'm, uh, it's most satisfying. Uh, even the you know the choice of co-driver and Greg did a top job. Uh, you know, uh, you know I chose him and uh, and he did a top job. And all the decisions that count to make you win the race uh, ultimately had to come out of uh, my corner. And uh, uh, I'm very happy that they were all right. Larry, when you were approaching Bathurst for 1993, realistically speaking, did you think you could go there and put the car on pole and do it the way it, it happened? Or was it more a case of uh, you knew you had a reliable motor car and you'd be there when it counted? No, from the day we did the Bathurst press day, uh, uh, I came home obviously with my crew and uh, we sat down and we couldn't believe the lack of pace of the opposition. And we set about very uh, deliberately we would be on pole and we, we didn't obviously go around the singing that from the rooftops. We, we knew in-house that we were going to go up there, we were going to be ultra competitive, we were aiming to get pole, we could see no reason why we wouldn't and then we were obviously aiming to win the race. It was, a, it was something that we did without uh, uh, big noting but internally we all had a mission and there's ten guys here work uh, with me and uh, we all had, had a single-minded approach and it's paid off. guess from a, the point of view of someone like me watching the race quite easily. Well, the difference is that all parts of my team, we all pulled at 100% and that preparation goes back six months. Uh, we've got, uh, each area has got a special uh, person and we've got special, you know, blokes who do the engines, blokes who do the gearbox and etc, etc. And then it all comes together and one guy then looks after the car. And now everyone pulled uh, together and uh, uh, wasn't uh, oblivious to the other guy. And we, we, we uh, talk, always uh, talk about the whole technical issue so we all know what each other's doing. And we had no gaps. And I think uh, that's the, the real issue. We had nothing go wrong because we had covered all the gaps. And uh, really, that's how it's supposed to happen. But really does. Mate, uh, you were earning the tag, not just this year, you've always enjoyed the tag, the great Aussie battler and uh, you've always been one of the perennial favourites wherever you race, the adopted son at Mount Panorama, there's no doubt about that. Is that because of the fact that you believe that you're perceived in, in most people's eyes as being just that, the battler that is obviously trying to compete and beat the mega million dollar teams uh, and in some cases obviously the factory team? Well, it's probably not a, a, a title that I've sought or even commented on, but the reality of it is I've been racing for 24 years and this Castrol sponsorship that I've enjoyed in this year, uh, with the full support from Dunlop, it's the first time that's ever happened. Now, uh, it's, it's hard to win a race when the whole industry is about that you've got to have a lot of money so you can buy everything right. We've had to go about it other ways. We've had to engineer our way through areas where we couldn't afford it and so on. But um, it's a title that um, uh, doesn't worry me. And I'm, I must admit, I'm uh, totally uh, delighted that to have a crowd on, on side. And uh, uh, you know, if, that's, uh, if that keeps up, well, that's great. Larry, Fred Gibson told me on the Friday prior to Bathurst that his two Winfield cars 
owe him a, a minimum of $300,000 each. I understand that uh, from your point of view you'd find it difficult to spend that much on a car. Well we have a different approach and uh, I can't comment on what others have but we sell a Holden engine Commodore for 175000 Now. We have to be efficient. I mean, I have to uh, uh, pay the rent and pay the guys every week. We cannot take forever to do do uh, jobs. Now, other teams obviously have a different approach, but uh, uh, it's all about efficiency. And uh, I run my business on uh, small business principles, and that means absolute efficiency, and we have no room for uh, time waste. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, in this scenario, the Holden Racing Team under Tom Walkinshaw must really be scratching their head and it's not the first time you've done it and it's not the first time that others have it's happened before as well but here we are the factory team and you have comprehensively defeated them in every single respect with uh, half the budget half the resources and obviously not having uh, the access to uh, the latest and great wind tunnel testing and all of that sort of thing well we're, we're obviously uh, happy to beat all other cars now um, uh, throughout the year people have uh, said, you know, who, who's your opposition? Is it the Winfield team or is it the Holden race team? And I've been very single-minded about it. The opposition who is whoever is in front of me. I'm not going to single out one Holden team or one other Ford team. It's it's everyone. And uh, we have to be in front of everyone. Not you know, and, and I'm not phased by titles and reputations because uh, we all know they don't... Uh, you know, that's not the bit that really counts, it's the hardware and the uh, uh, the way they get their act together on the day and uh, I might add on the day uh, we had some very worthwhile or worthy competition from uh, Mark Scaife and Jimmy Richards in the Winfield team and uh, uh, one would be silly not to uh, uh, dismiss that because you know they pressed on absolutely flat out just like us and uh, on the day though a couple of dice did roll our way uh, just with a bit of choice of tyres, you know, they lost a couple of seconds with the pace car and things like that. So uh, uh, the competition, though, certainly at Bathurst, was very worthy from the, uh, for, certainly from that team. Larry, I, I classify you as one of the most uh, charismatic people in Australian touring car racing, and, and quite unique in some respects. You always tell it the way it is, and people respect you for that. I know one of the aspects of motor racing, particularly in touring cars, that you're not all that keen on is testing. You've made comments in the past that teams that spend a lot of money testing go to racetracks and there's, uh, there's no spectators there, there's no TV there, so why spend all the money? I guess philosophies like that make your Bathurst win that much greater because you wouldn't have spent half the time testing that the top teams have. Now we're, we're absolute anti-testing uh, from, a, from a cost point of view. Uh, look, we could test every day of the week, but I would then need a massive budget. The, 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 you know, you said it, the problems with testing is nobody watches it, it doesn't help the sponsors and it spends a lot of money. So uh, I'm uh, uh, seeking that uh, we should ban testing just like Formula One, purely on the rounds of cost and uh, we then can at least go to the races basically being equal. It allows uh, new people and uh, what's called younger people to be able to access into our industry and let them test but don't let us uh, so-called professionals test and uh, I think there's uh, somewhere along the line got to be a happy medium of uh, restrictions to the uh, top end and uh, access to the bottom end. five-litre formula is the best formula that Australian racing has ever had and ever is a long time. The, um, uh, don't forget the first rule in the book when we all discussed this formula at great length said that cams may tinker with it uh, when they see fit or whatever the words were. Now we all agreed with that and I will continue to agree with that because there is no way anyone can table a formula that is absolutely cast in concrete for the next... No one has that vision and things change and uh, I still totally support that and I think the little bit of tinkering uh, that's happened uh, is absolutely essential 
and it'll continue to go on. And uh, what can be wrong with that as long as it's uh, debated uh, properly and uh, all the facts are tabled? Larry, you've been motor racing for a long time. You've uh, mentioned 24 odd years. Uh, you've taken part in the elite of the sport, Formula One, and, and been one of this country's all time greats. Are you enjoying your motorsport now more than ever? I guess it's a silly question after such a great win, but you know what I mean. I do know what you mean, and um, I've, uh, I've got a, a very good understanding with the guys who work for me here that, uh, uh, that they put in a, the, the best effort they can because that they know I'm also doing the same thing. Now, the moment I see a deterioration in my own uh, input, I'll be first to recognise it and uh, first to back out of it and maybe put someone else in, but I don't see that that's going to happen inside the next 10 years for sure, and uh, I'm very comfortable with it. I'm very comfortable with the way I'm driving. Um, um, uh, it's, uh, it's efficient, I don't have to have any sort of middle management or team managers or whatever and it's, uh, it's just going along real nice and I don't see why we can't continue. Is there any way that you can see in the future that we can bring young blood into our elite category in Australia and develop them a little quicker? The only way is that uh, we have to recognise uh, that we have to continually work on the costs of cars so that we have cheaper cars that do all the same things and then, then you can uh, put other guys in and it's not all so uh, uh, difficult. But I'm not about uh, uh, creating socialism in car racing and young guys, no way am I going to give it to them easy. If they, if they, they've got to also get off their backside and do just what, whether it be I or the Glenn Seatons or Mark Scaifes or John Bowes or whatever, we've all had a, 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 a tough road and they've got to get in there with a bit of determination because there's no way I'm going to hand a drive to someone because he's got his hand up saying he wants a drive. He has to earn it, but we can help the path and the regular, uh, you know, the CAMS people can help. We have to continually make it cheaper. Larry, it would seem that every Bathurst event is uh, shrouded in some form of controversy or another. This year it was uh, more a case of Dick Johnson and John Bow being very public about their views on obviously once a year drivers at Bathurst. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, they certainly, uh, I think they made some, some statements there that were a bit emotional and uh, at the time they obviously felt that, but on reflection I'm sure they wouldn't be uh, saying the same things. My view is that there is only 10 or so professional drivers in Australia. Bathurst has to accommodate nearly 100 drivers and it's been doing that for the last 20 years and uh, there's been some very good uh, once a year drivers like Greg Hansford, like Greg Hansford, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of them around. It's just part of the race that you have different standards of drivers, you have different corners, you have different cars. It's just one of the obstacles. And uh, uh, in that incident with uh, Dick Johnson, uh, Bill O'Brien was the man. Now, poor old Bill, he obviously feels very bad about it, but uh, he's been around Bathurst many, many times, and I would call him a very experienced driver. There's no way. Uh, uh, he, uh, let's say, uh, caused anything deliberately. Uh, he come unstuck for reasons that I don't know, and I reckon that's just part of racing. And uh, uh, and uh, I can't side at all with the comments. And uh, I've been down that path. I've been taken out on the first lap of Bathurst by a inexperienced driver, and in other races I've also taken out uh, drivers. So it's a two-way street, and we've just got to cop the good and the bad. And uh, I welcome and uh, want the uh, once a year is to uh, continue on and uh, not be impeded by this sort of argument. Can you nominate for me the best touring car driver in Australia, pound for pound, or is there too many of them so closely matched? Well, it's a difficult question, that. Uh, uh, I can say, though, that uh, um, I, can, I can have some very good races with a few of them, and. Uh, you know, uh, Mark Scaife is a guy you can race against very well and have a good race. John Bow is another one, Tony Longhurst. But to try to single uh, um, them out to be, let's say, better than the other recognised top six or seven is, 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 is probably uh, a bit wrong. And, uh, you know, we're all very much the same. Uh, in, uh, and on the day we have different winners. And uh, I think it's an, it's an ideal situation that we can't have our so-called 10 or 12 top drivers so evenly matched.